I'm Arie Schwartz, along with Eli Horowitz, and welcome to the WNBA Insider Podcast, a six-week deep dive into each WNBA team. This week, we got the Washington Mystics and the Minnesota Lynx. First, we got a little free agency update. A big trade went down. Indy, Phoenix, and Minnesota all had a trade going on. Indy got a first-round pick, the number eight pick from Phoenix. Phoenix moved back to the 12th pick and got Brianna January, and Minnesota got D-Rob. What are your initial thoughts? Mine are Indy got the best out of this trade. Phoenix, you could argue they did a lot of good stuff on this, but I still think dropping back four picks is a loss that you have to take into account in this draft. And Minnesota, I got my issues with the D-Rob pick. Go. I give them an A. That's my grade. They took a 31-year-old player who can still be productive in Brian January, and obviously she's a legend in Indiana, so I know – from a fan perspective, that's not going to be easy for the Indiana fans. But this, to me, is potentially one of the best drafts. Um, It could go down as one of the best drafts in WNBA history. And I feel there are eight kind of elite players. There are eight prospects to me that would be lottery picks in almost any other draft. So for Indiana to get the number eight pick to go along with their number two pick, in this draft, they're going to get, you know, two of those eight elite prospects is huge. And I think it shows some maturity on the part of Pokey Chapman to say, you know what, we need to rebuild this team. We have an opportunity to do that um, and move on from a player that you knew it wasn't going to be necessarily popular with the fans, but it was the right move. I, I give them an A. Yeah, I, I got to agree with that. I think it was – it's one of those moves that, and, and not to criticize the W, but a lot of times I think in the W where the fan bases are really important and, and, and the faces of the franchise and the way that the, the original contracts are, I think often a lot of teams don't necessarily make these moves to take, you know, they lost one face of the franchise uh, of basically the whole franchise in Tamika Ketchins before, and then they lose basically her right-hand person um, in January. So like, that was somebody that I know I know the fans loved and it would be hard to do, but as a team you have to make those those business decisions and to be able to get a a first round pick for her is huge. Now we've talked about this a lot. Now they're in a situation where they can say, All right, there's we talked about this like I think four top tier uh guards in this draft, and they can possibly you know, get a bit so like a front court person. You have a lot of opportunity to get to fill two positions, and then remember they're back with the fourteenth pick because they have the, the 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 second pick in the second round. So like, you can really reshape your roster just in the first fifteen picks of this draft. Oh yeah, I mean, think about it this way: Chicago and Indiana have four of the top eight picks uh, for this season, twenty eighteen. Th- those aren't contending teams, but those two teams could could really rebuild a lot quicker than many think. Um, with, it's not just that they have four of the top eight picks. It's that the other teams don't have it, right? That's two teams that have get, are getting cut out. Yeah. I mean, it, but and the other cool thing about this trade is, is that then you look at Phoenix, who is kind of on a different note than Indiana. Now, I think I look at Phoenix kind of, they have an opportunity, and I think they, they made their choice kind of as, we want to win now. We see a, a vet player who's, I mean, she's, she still can produce, like you said, but we need someone to draw some attention, someone who will make you pay for just double teaming BG and DT all the time. Again, if, if you're a supporter of the move, you look at it and say, okay, we're in a win now mode. We have Brittany Griner, Diana Tarazi, who knows how many years she has left. Okay. If Bonner decides to stay, that's another veteran. So we need to make upgrades right now. And I think you saw that in their offseason. They added Sancho Little to kind of fortify their defensive front court. And now you bring in Brian January, who could potentially start next to DT. And DT can be more of the shooting guard and, and kind of allow January to guard the better players and use her energy that way. And, you know, I, I understand that. And, and January is a 37% career three point shooter. So she struggled a little bit last year. She was down to 32%, but 
Um, I don't think she was fully healthy. So she's more of a 37% from her career. And so like you said, now if you have January and Tarazi out there, and it makes it a lot harder to double team Griner. Not to mention Leilani Mitchell, who can come in and light it up from three as well. And you could even have all three of them out there in some lineups. So I definitely think as far as winning now, this is a good move. But I will say that was a very steep price to give up. Very. You know, the number eight the number eight pick could be Jordan Canada or Lexi Brown, who could be your point guard of the future when Tarazi retires. And from that perspective, I feel like Phoenix did give up a little bit too much, but they did get the number 12 pick back. So they'll still have a first round pick. So, I mean, in, in, a, in a way, they get January and the 12th pick to give up the eighth. I just think in any other year, any other year, I would say, wow, that was a home run for Phoenix. You know, they still have a first round pick. They upgraded their roster. It makes them more of a threat to win the title this year. But I think in this particular draft, that eighth pick is a potential franchise point guard. And if you're planning for the future with Brittany Griner, it could we could look back and say this is a lost opportunity. I completely agree, especially because, you know, you still have arguably the GOAT. Like, in the same way that we talked about when we were talking about Seattle, that they have Sue Bird, who could possibly be training in a Jewel Lloyd and another draft pick in a, in a guard position for the next couple of years. You have to think about that with Diana Taurasi. Like, this is not me hating on January at all, but what I am saying is, you know, January is going to retire, and most likely the player who goes number eight in this draft, who arguably could be a point guard uh, who plays very well, that person is still going to be playing, God willing, you know, like barring injuries. So, like, again, it's are you looking at the now or are you looking at, uh, at the later? And I think it, uh, in Phoenix's defense, and this has to be said, is January still has some years left, all right? Yes, she had a little bit of an injury. She had some injury issues last year. Um, but I think it, it, seeing that she is healthy and seeing that, you know, she can still produce is going to be huge for them. But now moving on to, to Minnesota, who then – now, Phoenix, as, as we end... Let, let, me yeah. just say, let me just say quickly, her career player efficiency rating is 12 for her career. And the league average is 15. That's league average production. And she's below that. And she hasn't had one season at 15. So, again, I think January is a productive player because she can shoot the three and defend. But, again, we... When you bring in the advanced numbers and, and the numbers don't lie, this is not my opinion. I'm just reading the numbers. Um, I think some players are overrated by reputation than than the advanced metrics. And someone who with a player efficiency rating of a 12 in, in a long career is definitely not you know equal value to the number eight pick, just from a straight analyst perspective. Um, I'm going to be honest. For Phoenix, if they don't make the finals, this trade was a bust. You know, the, if they're going to make a move like this and give up a pick like that, they have got to make the finals this year to to justify it. I'll end with that on Phoenix. No, I, I agree, and, and I but I think something you touch on, which is she can shoot the ball and pull the defense, which is exactly what Phoenix did not get from D. Rob, and that kind of transitions us into Minnesota, and now Minnesota. Got out of they they do have a second round pick in this draft, but they moved out of the first round and they got a what people are calling a defensive specialist because, as noted, she has never made a three point shot in her career. So I think, rightfully so. Now, there's been a lot of discussion. I think this is part of the reason we picked the links for this podcast. There's been a lot of discussion between Lynx fans and us, and you know, different analysts of the league saying. Okay, if the argument is that D. Rob is taking Renee Montgomery's kind of anchor position in the second string in the bench lineup, um, I think a lot of us look at Renee Montgomery as a player who brought intensity and speed, but also was her lights out shooting. You know, she had multiple games in the 20s, she had multiple games where she would just light it up. And so when you fill that position with someone who has never made a three point shot in her six year career, I think that raises some questions. And 
Well, before we get into the questions that we asked uh, head coach Cheryl Reeve, I want to know what were your initial thoughts on this trade? I'm probably, of the three teams, I give Minnesota probably the lowest grade. They're, they're right there with Phoenix. Like I said, I give Indy an A. Phoenix, uh, you know, again, B minus, C plus. Like I said, if they make the finals this year and make a run, you know, I'll admit, hey, that they went for it and I'll admit I was wrong. I just, to me, Bree, Bree doesn't close the gap with Minnesota and L.A., so I think they'll ultimately regret giving up that eighth pick. I think Minnesota, I go like a solid C. Like, I, I understand from Coach Reeves' perspective that when you lose Montgomery, you had to bring in another veteran, and they're in a win-now mode. But again, this is another player that if you just look at the numbers, and it's not personal, if you just look at the advanced numbers – like you said, people are calling her a defensive stalwart. But again, is that because of her defense or is that almost what we say when a player can't shoot, right? You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of times if a player is not good on offense, we say, oh, but they're a great defender without really backing it up with video and stats. Like looking at the advanced metrics. Now from 2011 to 2014, when she was in San Antonio, she was a very good player. She had player efficiency ratings above 15 every season, but she actually was stronger on offense in those seasons. Um, Her offensive win shares were way better than her defensive win shares. Her assist percentage was fantastic, and her offensive rating was actually better than her defensive rating. Now she got hurt, and she missed the 2016 season, and last year... She had a player efficiency rating of 11.7, well below the league average, and her offensive and defensive rating were both below average. So, first of all, Renee Montgomery led the league in defensive rating, the entire WNBA. So we're not just talking about losing a shooter in Montgomery. They also lost one of the best defenders in the league. D-Rob's defensive numbers just don't add up to Montgomery's. Her offensive numbers, as you mentioned, she's never made a three in her career. Now, if she gets back to her 2014 form and she's healthy, then maybe this trade is okay and I'd go back up to a B. But that's a big if when you miss an entire year. And as I mentioned, she was actually better on offense in terms of advanced metrics, and that's due to her ability to use her speed to get into the lane and dish the ball around, which she is good at, and Coach Reeve mentions that. But again, are you healthy enough to really be doing that? That's, I mean, that's a good question, and I think there has to be something to be said that, you know, in an interview with Canis Hoopis, uh, uh, head coach did say that their original plan was to re-sign Renee. Then free agency took a turn. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not going to say that, oh, they're just reshuffling after Renee left, because I, I think that's kind of insulting to them, because I think you always have those backup plans, and they do have confidence in Alexis Jones, and she really stepped it up. Um I think let's let's go to the questions that that we uh, we sent over to Cheryl and and hear her responses, chat about that a little bit, and then we're going to dive in to the X's and O's and what they can do to be better. Um, the first question we asked was last year you talked of the importance for a three point shot to grow in the W or the three point shot growing in the W. We saw Rebecca Brunson grow in that regard. Now you bring Robinson in, D Rob, who hasn't made a three point shot in her career. How does that affect your offense? And her response was to the point. I suspect Robinson, D-Rob, will create even more opportunities for three-point shots with her ability to get to the rim. All right. The second question that we asked is, do you feel you and the Lynx staff can fix D-Rob's shot? And I think that's a legitimate question to ask, considering that her, her, her shooting numbers have gone down. And her response was, we are very confident in the player development aspect of our operations. All right. And the last question that was asked is, how does this trade impact Alexis Jones' role? And this is the the response that, honestly, I'm most excited about, which is Jones knows what she has to do to carve out a role on this team. And to me, that is a coach challenging a young player who's shown a lot of promise. And this year is going to be an increased amount of minutes and saying, you know, we want you to step up and be that player. You got to prove it to us. So like, I understand a lot of a lot of people who've been following the links will say, of course they need a D Rob. They always go with a vet off the bench and blah, blah, blah. And our response to that has always been very to the point, which is that's amazing, that's lovely. But D Rob was a trade, which means that there's other veterans out there that could have been 
like an option, an opportunity for a trade. So I don't buy that as saying like they needed a vet. There's vets on the free agency market and there's vets you could trade for. Um, right. And also they, you know, if you hold the 12th pick, maybe on draft night, there's another team that's a little desperate because I feel like with the draft, a lot of pressure comes and the Lynx, they don't have as much pressure. They're the defending champions. They're proven. So what happens, I feel like on draft night, there may be the potential to make a deal when another team that's trying to rebuild or isn't as secure in their position maybe gets a little de- desperate and is willing to give up you know, more than you ask for. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, put them in a situation, put them in a, in a basketball reference, put them in a, they're up by, they're down by one or whatever, and they have to make a big play at the end of the game. You know, make them sweat it. You're, you're the champs. Um, and I think you need to walk with that right. swagger. And, and Reeves has shown that she has that swagger about her, in my opinion. One of, like, the strong-handed moves of this offseason was her trade to, uh, to Seattle, where she basically gets to say, Next year, if whichever team does worse, we're taking that draft pick, which I thought was an amazing move. Now, I will say, to defend Minnesota, this was a three-team trade, though. So, again, we, we can still have the opinion that they shouldn't have done this trade, but to be fair, if this was a three-team trade and these were the offers on the table, it's not. this wouldn't necessarily have been available later, right? Because it, it'd be hard not- my understanding was it wasn't. My understanding is it was three individual trades. Well, that's kind of semantics, right? I mean, you do the trade knowing you're going to make the next trade. Yeah. So, but the question is, and I think this is something that I would love to hear, because uh, uh, in, in an interview that I saw Reeves do, she did say that you know the the Robinson trade came as you know they they brought it up and it came out of nowhere, kind of. We weren't expecting it, um, but you know. That, that happened. So I think, you know, maybe Phoenix knows those trades are happening. Do you think Minnesota necessarily has that in the know? I got the impression um, just from talking to various people around the league and, and, and just doing research. Um, I kind of get the impression that Phoenix may have been the aggressor in this trade. They really wanted to upgrade and win now, um, you know, and offered that pick and, they went after January, but but a third team needed to get involved because I don't think Indiana wanted to take back Robinson, right? I mean, when I don't know. Again, I'm again. I've talked to some sources, but this is also me trying to put a puzzle together. But I feel like they Phoenix knew they wanted to upgrade, knew they had this eighth pick to offer, but they didn't. They wanted January, and so they needed to pull in a third team, and they were able to give Minnesota a veteran and get back a pick. Um, I don't know. Again, similar to Phoenix. If, if Phoenix makes the finals and January shoots 35% from three, I'm going to you know take back my word. But let's just finish on this trade by saying this. The way I look at it is, there th- you know, if you look at Phoenix, LA, and Minnesota as win-now contenders, LA upgraded by getting Cappy without having to give anything up or mortgage their future because they signed her as a free agent. You know, Minnesota and Phoenix gave up first round picks to upgrade their rosters. And I don't necessarily think the players they got right now at this stage today are necessarily worth first round picks. Having said that, if it results in a championship, obviously it's worth it. So again, it's never a black and white with a trade. We have to wait and see what happens. I just think LA got a little edge this offseason in the way that they were able to upgrade without giving up anything. I think something that's really interesting is when you're talking about the Minnesota Lynx diving into their X's and O's, they they were a very efficient team offensively and defensively, but their their weaknesses really didn't come from def- too much defensive struggles. We saw a few games where they just, you know, Cheryl came out and just rung them a new one because they played horrible. I mean, but generally, generally, their defense was not the issue. It was really cold streaks on offense. And, you know, I, I was critical of Maya Moore's season last season. You know, granted, it's Maya Moore. So when she's having a down season, she's still a top 10 player in the league or a top five player in the league. So, like, what does that really mean? I'm excited. I think, you know, the time she's doing overseas right now with other top talent in that powerhouse team over there in Russia, you know, 
we're going to see her come into this season with Ma, a lot more of a pizzazz and a lot more of a, a killer instinct throughout the whole season than let's say we did last year when we saw her kind of be streaky. Um, how can the Lynx with now what we're saying is, is obviously Alexis Jones will have to force her way, excuse me, into some time. How can the Lynx just stay hot and keep shooting? I mean, they got, I'm, I'm going to butcher the name, uh, Zanda Lassini, um, and Fig Bentley and Alexis Jones. They got some young players in there. You know, what do you see as the strength? Do you see them running off of, of, of Sylvia Fowles again for another season? Do you think that maybe it's the season that Sylvia and Maya kind of play ping pong? Well, you, there's a lot to unpack there. I think the strength of this team is the defense, right? They are always going to defend at a high level. They rebound. The offensive rebound, and when Brunson and Fowles are attacking the offensive and defensive glass, this is a team that's nearly impossible to beat because they don't give you any easy shots, and you have to just outscore them and get really hot yourself. But I do think you bring up a fair point. If there's a concern going into this season, it is shooting and scoring because they lost Renee, and they have a veteran team that every year, I mean – I'm not going to say players are just losing a step, but they are getting older. So I think there are some real concerns about, you know, and again, we're talking in the finals here or in the semifinals, not in the regular season. But if there is a concern, it's if they go through those cold streaks this year and they don't have Renee Montgomery to kind of get them out of there, what's who are they going to turn to? Because obviously Robinson doesn't necessarily solve those problems. Um, I think the hope is that Alexis Jones takes a big step. And, you know, we saw even in the finals last year, she she knocked down a bunch of threes and really spaced the floor and gave them another element. Um, but that's a lot of pressure to put on one player to say, hey, you're, you're now going to be responsible for bench scoring. And and if our starters are cold, you need to come in and, and score. You know, that that's a lot different than asking a, a Cappy Pondexter who's proven she can do yeah. that. I mean, that, that's really the question, but I think something that, and uh, you're get a lot of flack for this from Lynx fans, but something that really goes underrated is, all right, yeah, history has shown that Reeve likes to, to have, have vets on the team to run that important position, you know, kind of the, the shot caller of, of their, their team on the bench. But with that argument being said, you can't do that forever. You, that that is a, a stopgap solution until the younger players are old enough that you can trust them. And as she said in that quote, Jones knows what she has to do to carve out a role in our team. I I do not put it past them to say sit down with Jones and say this is what we want from you, and if you can deliver this, like you're taking over. You're t- you got the reins to the castle, the keys to the castle when when Lindsay's gone. Well, I also think that. Coach Reeve probably recognizes that Jones can really play off the ball as well. I mean, you saw her in the finals. I mean, she can really space the floor. And so if Jones is bringing the ball up and having to run the offense and call the plays, first of all, she's going to have – the point guard's always going to have ball pressure on them. So in some ways, if if Jones' greatest asset right now is her ability to make threes, then having her off ball is advantageous – because her defender is going to be helping off and she's open. Whereas if she has to bring the ball up, there's going to be ball pressure on her. And maybe that doesn't really maximize what she can do now. Like you said, though, in the long run, you, you want to develop that, but that's always the challenge and they're in a title window. Now I do want to bring up though, you know, coach Reeve did make a good point that Robinson's speed, she can collapse the defense and kick out to get more open threes. But I want to ask you, is, is, is this speed thing overrated? I mean, I know there were injury questions. Is, she, is Robinson really have that elite speed that she had back in 2014, where she's just going to collapse the defense and, and kick out to shooters? I'm weary to say no. And I'm very inclined to say yes. Um, and the reason that I'm, I'm so iffy about it or, or, or not, I express it that way is because I think last year, even though she was quote unquote fully recovered, there's still that mental block that you have when you have injuries. Um, and so for me, I think when, when you're coming out of a serious injury and you're coming out of something that, that affects you and your speed like that, I would say, you know, come second year, 
you would assume that they're more comfortable with it and possibly at a better area. Also, they're not, you know, in the position she's in, they're not going to be relying on her. Um, they're going to rely on her for very specific roles. And that's something that the links are insanely efficient about doing is carving out specified roles for the the person and and their their skill set and it works in a way that has really been advantageous for the links in the past and so i have to like as much as i like hate agreeing with the fans on this i have to say that you have to give credit to uh head coach and the training staff for their ability to isolate single aspects of someone's game and say we we need that on our team they did it with gia perkins they did it with planet pearson um, and I they've know, done but, it with other players in the back. Come on. I mean, uh, this player hasn't made a three in her career. We're not talking about somebody who's struggled from three and they're going to fine tune it. I, mean, I personally, personally, I don't. Oh, but even the speed. I mean, she had an Achilles injury. I mean, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not a trainer. I'm not there. But I do know that as a basketball coach, that is a severe, severe injury. And a lot of players with Achilles injuries, do not fully recover. I mean, they'll just always be a little bit slower after that. So I think it's a concern. And and my biggest thing, and I know we were engaging with some people on Twitter, is let's say they're in the finals against L.A. I mean, can't you just tell Chelsea Gray, hey, sag, sag five feet off of her? You know, just let her shoot, sag five feet off. I understand she has the speed to get in the lane, but – Shouldn't a smart defender just take ten feet, sag five feet off of her? And in the pick and roll, there was another, you know, analyst I respect saying the the D Rob fouls pick and roll can be lethal. But again, can't you can just go under screens and force her to shoot? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely going to cause another another, if you will, chess move by other teams of saying this is a weakness that we need to take advantage of. But that's what. That's what every team tries to do, and then the the opposing team tries to uh, to nullify that with a different move, and that's the chess game. And I think you know you never want to have someone who has an an obvious weakness. But I, again, I'm not saying that all of a sudden the 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 links will get it and like figure out oh now she can shoot threes and she's gonna be lights out. I'm not saying that. I I, I think that's a little bit of a, a fan fantasy, if you will. But what I will say is, uh fouls you know is an elite player who's still at the top of the game and you know she they don't nec- like again it's a small role we're talking about we're being very picky Renee Montgomery had a huge role in the team last year but we're still being very picky because this is arguably the number one or the number two team um and in our power rankings we've talked about this a lot I say they're number one because they're the defending champs they have uh, the, I mean, they've won every other year. So, you know, the the conspiracy theorists would say that they're going to lose this year. Um, but on the positive, there's no Olympics this year. So another person might say that they're going to win because that's always a bad thing for them, too. So, you know, I think there's if you're going to be critical of the links, you have to get very picky because there's not a lot of holes on their front line. Kind of similarly to what we were talking about with L.A., which is you have to be very picky because they are that top of the league. They're on that upper echelon that it's really the links and the sparks. And then you have a couple other teams vying to get on that, that second echelon right below them. Um, we've kind of dragged on a little bit about the links cause they they pulled some headlines with that trade, but we do want to pay attention to our second team of the week. And that's the Washington mystics. And they, they kind of had some news earlier on in a, uh, in free agency and we'll just recap that real quick. Uh, Emma Miesman will not be playing with the team. Um, and basically, they signed uh, Monique Curry. And I think there's a lot to talk about this team. Eli, I'll let you go first and, and give me some thoughts and, and, and what's going on when you first look at this team. Because they did make the playoffs. Beginning of the season last year, they were projected to be a top team. Um, and they made a push, but they did struggle. I mean, this is a team that unfortunately has just not been able to stay healthy. Last year, Della Don missed significant time. Taylor Hill tore ACL, and that was a very underrated injury. I think she's, you know, she's not necessarily a star star of this league, but that was a team that didn't have a ton of depth. Um, 
especially with their bench being some younger players. And that was a huge blow. She was having a very nice season. Um, and then Misamin missed time for overseas commitments. So I feel like last year they just never – they never had their starting five and their rotation of eight or nine players like for very many stretches of games. And then you get to the playoffs and you don't have Hill – and you suddenly have to pull it all together last second. Now this year, uh, right away, they have a huge blow of Misaman, you know, not gonna not gonna be playing. And so once again, we're not gonna be able to see this team at full health. Now the positive news is they have Elena Della Don, who, you know, in my mind, is right there with Candace Parker as the most versatile, complete player in the WNBA and she shot 38% from three. She can post up drive. Her defensive metrics are great. I mean, it's weird. She's, I feel like, is this a hot take? I feel like in some ways because of the injuries and the time missed and the, I I don't think she's become, uh, um, all right. There's, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Let, Let me, let me clarify. I'm saying that because like last year we talked so much about fouls and the and the bigs and I'm not I don't think anyone out there is saying she's underrated as in as then we haven't really talked about her as much last season. I think you know she, she's a she's a top three player in the league, isn't she? I'm with you. I think a lot of that had to do last year with you know there was a little bit of blowback from the trade demands, and I think that happens no matter what you know, but also. Again, and we've talked about this, and that's why we do our deep dive on each individual team. Mainstream sports media does not cover, doesn't give enough attention to the W. So if they're paying attention to, let's say, four stories in the league, and Sylvia Fowles is having a record breaking season and just dominating, Candace Parker's and Hurt and NECA are on, are on the rebound from winning a championship and going for it. Brittany Griner is having an amazing season along with. Uh, Diana Taurasi setting records. And then a lot of people also had, you know, New York uh, with Liberty, the Connecticut Sun. And then, in, like, I think there was just too many stories. And that's, again, why we do these podcasts about each team. There's so many stories. And eventually, Eagle claim there's not enough room for them to talk about Elena Deladon, who was injured a little bit during the season. The team sputtered and didn't live up to early expectations that everybody had because of this big name. Now, I think. We talked about this before. My hot take is I think this team can be better this season than they were last year with Miesman being gone. And let me let me back that up with a little something. Hot take. You got – hot take. You got it. All right. You got Tolliver back. All right. Okay. She was setting records for most threes in a game. She's still a killer out there. All right. You got Elena Deladon, who's healthy. All right. Now, obviously, she has some health issues. She's like has never played a full, complete season, but like that we we – we explored that, and that's a little bit of a BS because, you no, know, she basically does. Um, you got a, a Natasha Cloud coming back from injury. You got a, a Hightower. You got a Shatori, who's young and, and hungry, and you got a draft pick. Now, I think possibly this team could have the ability to play better to the strengths of EDD and Tolliver than they were last year. Because last year, I thought they were a little bit crowded. Now, when they succeeded in the playoffs, I, I, I was live at the Dallas game, and I was live for the game against Minnesota. Um, when they succeeded, they were able to crash the boards and control the paint. And a lot of that had to do with having three bigs out there, having Meese, Deladon, and Thomas, all right, or sometimes Hawkins. But my thing is, I don't necessarily think if we're talking Hawkins or Thomas going up against, you know, Candace Parker or NECA or Brittany Griner or Sylvia Fowles, I think she, they're going to struggle a lot. All right. But now you have the ability. Del Don has a little bit more room. All right. Because having Neesman in there, she takes up a spot because you need to be getting her some touches to get the ball. I mean, I could go on for this uh, for a really long time. I just think Natasha Cloud plus Tolliver and Deladon, like, I think this could be a new face team that is now able to... Deladon was the face of the team, and I'm ranting now, but Deladon was the face of the team last year, but the year before that, Misamin 
had really made a name for herself and you had to share the spotlight. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to agree with you that they're better off without Misamin. I think she's still a player that gives you, you know, double figures, can stretch the floor, is a very unique player. I don't think they're better without her, but I do think you make a fair point that there's still a formula for them to be a very good team. Um, one thing is I, I like some of their young players. Shatori Walker Kimbro shot 33% last year. And she only played 12 minutes a game um, and didn't have a big role, but she's going to get more minutes. Taylor Hill, um, I don't know if she'll be back to start the season. I'm assuming not, but I'm hopeful she can be back at some point in the season. I mean, she was averaging 13 points a game uh, when she went out and playing 25 minutes. So I know she plays a different position than Misamin, but from a production standpoint, you could argue that if she comes back, she can kind of fill in those points to lose with Misamin. Um, and then not to mention Crystal Thomas. I mean, sh- she really surprised and she, she averaged three offensive rebounds a game, um, 10 rebounds a game overall, seven points. I mean, she was really a difference maker. And I think what happened is Washington started the season, and I read interviews with Tebow, they wanted to be a three-point shooting team, right? They looked at it. They said, we have Misamin and Della Don who can stretch the floor as our bigs. We're going to shoot threes. And they tried to do that. Um, they put up a ton of threes. They led the league in attempts. So let me go over some stats. They led the league in three-point attempts last year. And they were second in makes. However, they were at the bottom of the league. They were ninth or 10th in actual percentage. So they went out there and they wanted to be this team that jacked up a ton of threes. And they did jack up a ton. But they were not a – they just weren't making them. Now, they were second in makes, but that's because of the attempts. Like I said, in percentage, they were towards the bottom of the league. And only Della Don shot above 35%. Tolliver was 34. She had a down year from three until the playoffs. Latta was 32%. Nisiman was 32. Hill was 30. So only Della Don was really shooting an efficient percentage from three. But, but they found this formula on the flip side with Crystal Thomas of being a bigger team that crashed the glass and played inside. And I think... They, I think they can really build on that this year and just try to be the best rebounding team in the league, be a tough defensive team, not overly aggressive, pack the paint with Deladon, um, with Hawkins, with Thomas. Tierra Ruffin-Pratt is a very underrated defender herself, and I think they could really be a slower team that rebounds. And then when they go to their second unit, I'd like to see them put Della Don around these younger players in Walker, Kimbrough, in Cloud, in Hightower, and maybe with their bench, they can push the pace with Della Don and with Tolliver. You know, keep one starter out there with the, those bench units and play a bit, some small ball. But I think with the starters, they need to build on that kind of rebounding identity that they really had. And, um, that's kind of my take on where they are as a team and what they need to do this year. Going into last season, uh, Deladon, Miesemann, and Tolliver, all three of them were top five in three-point shooting percentage. So, like, in, in a, lot of, a lot of, you know, people will say is that those stats show that, you know, they just played horrible coming into that season as far as three-point shooting. So I think they're, you're right. Like, there's many other ways, but... The team, as far as Crystal Tolliver is concerned, is expected to be shooting much better from three than they did last year. So that's a positive you got to look at. Also, um, they did rank 10th in the league in the PNR on defense. Um, they struggled on that. I know you were you were taking a deeper dive into some of the in some of the looks and and what they can do. Their bigs, in ways, struggled to move off of the pick. Yeah, their pick and roll defense, and I looked at the tape, was an issue. They have very talented defensive players, and their defense overall was middle of the pack. If they can shore up the pick and roll, um, I think they can be a top five defense. Uh, but the issue, like the issue with their pick and roll defense, is you had Ivory Latta kind of as the backup point guard who, kind of at this stage in her career, kind of died on screens and struggled. 
Tolliver is a very capable defender, but she was pretty average in the pick and roll in terms of the advanced stats. And um, I think some of that is just she's a veteran. It's hard every play when you get hit by a screen to just go balls to the wall to fight over. I think I'm not worried about her come playoff time defensively. So I think that's something. But I think – you know, there. I think what may have happened is they developed schemes around Della Don and Misamin, but then at, Thomas ends up being the starting center. And I think with Thomas, when I watched the film, she was coming up too high to hedge or show on the pick and roll. And I think they need to just drop her back more and be more conservative and allow her to just stay by the rim and alter shots and rebound. And I think... You know, I mean, obviously, Miesemann won't be there this year, but she would also come up high in the film and just players would go right around her. So I think, you know, Tebow, as far as X's and O's, is a good coach. And I think he'll be able to clean that up. Again, from my perspective, it would be dropping them back, going to a more conservative drop back scheme. And I think that would solve a lot of their problems. And then I think with their second unit, they should just switch more. I think with with Cloud and Hightower and Rupp and Pratt and Walker, Kimbrough and Della Don, they could really switch one through five and just switch everything. But like I said, if Thomas is out there, they need to develop a pick and roll scheme that's very catered to her strengths and weaknesses. And again, they have, I know we talked about this before, and we haven't even touched on Monique Curry, who can also, in a sense of production wise, you know, and no one's going to argue that she's still in her prime. But what you can definitely make a point of is look at her when she was with San Antonio last year. I mean, she was shooting lights out. She was shooting well enough that Phoenix said, hey, we're struggling with D-Rob and offensive production. Let's bring her in. And they brought her in. And, and she did help that team in many, in many respects bring the team to the playoffs and have them in the semifinals. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said by that. I assume that. A couple things went into it. Monique Curry's from Washington area, from the DMV. So, you know, shout out to that. She'll probably be, she probably wanted to be home with her family. And the coaching staff knew Miesman's probably not going to be there. They probably knew that for a while. So, you know, I think that move was kind of, all right, we need to shore up some of that production and some of those points that she's getting. But now, like you were saying, we can start running some of those, some of those sets off of, Thomas and Deladon, and then, you know, Moni Curry, obviously a little bit smaller than Miesemann. But still a big addition. Yeah, I'm going to actually, and, and first of all, I know we, we talk about how we give hot takes and we say how we feel, but we're also not afraid to admit when we're wrong. And earlier, in an earlier podcast, I said I wasn't a big fan of the signing. And the more I thought about it, I am a fan of the signing. Because I think what I like about Moni Curry is, at this stage of her career, she really knows her role. So she, if Christy Tolliver is running pick and roll with Della Don or with Thomas, Curry is okay just spotting up from the corner. You know what I mean? Like she's not going to try to do too much and take the ball and go one-on-one. And I think with the starting unit that might play a little bit slower with Thomas out there, she actually fits pretty well as somebody who can shoot the three, bring some toughness, a little bit of rebounding. And then, like I said, she can also, with her positional flexibility, switch. So if she plays with some of those bench units, I think she can hold up in a switching scheme. So, again, at the time, I said I wasn't a fan of the signing because I just felt that these young players needed to get minutes. But I think, you know, really reflecting on it more, I'll admit that I think she can actually fit in really well, um, the more I thought about it, alongside Tolliver and Hey, you know, this is a team that has Della Don, and, and you do have to try to win now to some extent as well. And I think there's room for both, especially with Miesemann being out. That's a lot of minutes that are freed up. So I think there's room to both utilize Curry and develop some of the younger players. Yeah, and and the beauty is about Moni Curry, and, and we'll stop, you know, tuning her horn now. But one of the things that I really like about her is she hustles not like her age. And what I mean by that is she's putting in that extra effort, even though, you know, a lot of older players won't do that. And that's something that you got to respect. So I would say that I think their ceiling is the semifinals. I don't think necessarily, you know, even though I did say uh, with me, Scott, this team does have the potential to be better. I, I mean that in the sense of 
be more efficient? Like from the start of the season to the end of the season, overall be a better, more efficient team. And maybe that had to do with last year. They they didn't know or they they were struggling to kind of meld together. My thing is they they should be considered a a top four team. To me, the top teams based off of last year moving this year are Lynx, Sparks, uh, Connecticut Sun, and Washington. And then and then, you know. Mercury can arguably be in there after some plays or after some trades they've made. And then adding to that, uh, Atlanta, because that roster is stacked. Uh, Eli, what do you think? You- well, that's what, I want, that's what I want to ask you. I think we both agree tier one is LA and Minnesota. And I think we both said tier two for us is Connecticut, Phoenix, and Atlanta on paper. Obviously, they need to prove it. And, and that's not in a specific order. I think we both agreed – those five teams are tier one and tier two, right? So my, my question is, do you put Washington into that tier two or do you put them as like a tier, the top of a tier three? Uh, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm feeling good today. So I'm going to put them in, in tier two. I'm feeling, I'm feeling good today because, and the reason I say this is that Deladon has shown that she can carry a team to the finals. So the, and this team is pretty, is, this team has a good amount of players on them, and and I like the style of roster. It's a nice influx of of shooting, you know, vets and young players who can run the court. So, uh, I mean, like, all right, they're definitely teetering, but today I'd throw them in the tier two. Tomorrow I might throw them in tier three. Yeah, I'm starting to think of it a little different. I'm starting to think of it as L.A. and Minnesota tier one, Phoenix and Connecticut tier two. Again, not in any order. And then tier three for me would be, Kind of Washington on its own, you know. Again, I, I like Atlanta, but it's just we have to see. But that, that's the thing is, like, if the playoffs were best of seven series, I would say Washington is tier three. Like, they're just not as deep as these other teams. They have too many injury question marks. They don't have Mieseman. But because of the one game nature of the first two rounds, when you have Elena Della Don, like, I feel like I have to put them in tier two just because. In a one-game series, she's good enough to beat anybody. So I think it's kind of an, a little bit of an asterisk as far as how I would place them because they do have a player that I think in a one-game playoff, if you say, who would you want to have on your team in a one-game scenario? Yeah, I mean, let's do that real quick. Uh, I'd go... Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, I, I, mean, I might have to think on no, that. No thinking. I'd go Candace Parker. I'd go uh, Maya Moore. Brittany Griner and Elena Daldon. Okay, interesting. I think a lot of people would say Tarazi just because of her ability to take over games late. Um, I think Candace, yeah, Candace Parker, Maya Moore. I'm still going to put Tarazi for a one game playoff, we're talking. Uh, Elena Daldon, just such a force on both ends of the floor. And. Yeah. Oh, that's tough. I uh, tied for fifth would be Fowles and Griner. Um, I think those are the two best centers in the league. Um, I don't know. Let's let's come back to that because that's a juicy question, and and I feel like I'm just rattling off names without really looking at a list here. But let, we're gonna listeners. We're gonna do some after we get through our twelve teams. We're gonna do some fun podcasts. We're gonna do a mock draft. We're gonna do power rankings. So what do you say? Well, let's add that question to our list. That's kind of because that's what we're going to bring right before the season is kind of now some more fun topics that aren't the deep dives. Exactly. Stuff that, you know, will, we'll, as a fan, get your blood boiling and, and make you want to scream right. out on Twitter and say, no, screw you. My team is better than this and this player is better than that. Right. So, But, of course, we're still going to bring – we're going to bring the same film and analytics to those questions, and that's the difference. You know, we're not just going to say, oh, Maya Moore and Candace Parker because we like them. We might say, actually, if, if you look at the numbers, maybe it's Tina Charles, right? Because we watch the film. There's a lot of, we talk about the tiers and the power rankings. There's a lot of tier one players as far as player rankings. Um, and so because of that, I got to say, you know, it'll be exciting to get some more of that stuff in. We are in week five, I believe, of our six week dive. So we got one yeah, more who week. Do, who, who do we have left? Uh, we got... Um, I think we got Atlanta and Vegas left, no? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. A, a, oh, that'll be a good one. Two, two teams with a lot of new pieces. So that's our, that'll be our last deep dive, preseason deep dive. We're obviously going to hit these teams again. Uh, Eli, remind the folks where they can find you on Twitter. I'm at Coach Horowitz13. Find me on Twitter there. And- yeah. Uh, and again, guys, this has been the WNBA Insider Podcast. Arya Schwartz along with Eli Horowitz. We've been doing a deep dive into each team in the WNBA. And tune in to us next week when we cover the last two teams in the league.